Beyond capitalism lies an economics of enough. And beyond capitalism lies a not-for-profit world. On Monday, six people will trundle on in, just like I did today at Totnes Station, and they'll be here as part of a week-long journey that's part of a bigger year-long journey called a year in transition. I found out about it tonight at dinner with my host, and what excites me most is that it's emblematic of both Totnes and the surrounding areas, and it's emblematic of a rise of a not-for-profit ethic, and they will bring ideas and early seeded projects that they're working on that embody the not-for-profit ethic. They're not doing these community projects to make private gain, to get themselves ahead in an ultra-competitive world. These projects will be uh, a bakery that's being established, a slow food movement, uh, this is firstly in Wales and then one I believe up uh, around Bristol. There's someone who's working on a, a local community um, maker space in terms of remaking, upcycling, uh, local uh, excess waste and the like. And these are really exciting because they speak to an ethic that is returning us back to a story from long ago. Around the world now in Latin America we have Summa Calce and Buen Vivir movements that are looking at what makes a good life and how do we put well-being ahead of economic growth. We have the rise of the maker movements, the pro-ams, DIY, relocalization, transition towns, all these things that are coalescing in ways that are returning us from a spectrum back from the for-profit ethic back to the not-for-profit ethic and one that actually allows for an economics of enough. Because historically, in human history anyway, for so long, humans lived with a not-for-profit ethic. They weren't trying to maximise individual gain on the whole, both as societies, nor even really as individuals. There was selfishness that showed up in certain societies at certain times, but there were mechanisms, like the potluck in Indigenous cultures, where if someone had a certain level of wealth, they threw a feast until they became the so-called poorest and then they got a mark on their forehead or on their hut as a sign of respect. And it was an inbuilt wisdom in these systems that allowed for redistribution whilst also playing to that selfishness that popped its head up every so often. We have this uh, in, in Judaism, for example, with the seven year cycle and Jubilee, every 49 years, you would have a massive redistribution of wealth. The Chinese pass on money from elders to youngers each birthday. These mechanisms for financial redistribution that maintain harmony in societies. Yet only 400 years ago, we saw a dramatic shift towards a for-profit ethic, a notion of private gain. Only 400 years ago in that vicinity. In human history, that's a very recent shift. And since then, we've seen an acceleration, particularly in the last 50 or so years, towards a for-profit ethic, a me-first ethic with the rise of corporate culture and this story that tells us that the best way to organise an economy in terms of efficiency is for us to compete with each other and for self-interest to be the guiding rationale. If I look after my self-interest, then that will actually be for the greatest good of everyone. That's the story we've been told in economics in the last 60 years, the pervasive story of how to run an economy efficiently. Yet, as we know all too well, that story is taking us to destruction, particularly on two external fronts. The first is that we have the biggest financial inequity that the world has ever seen, right now. 85 people, so three times the audience in this room, 85 people control the same amount of wealth as half the world's population, three and a half billion people. Pause for a second and, and take that in, in terms of the magnitude. My hands don't do it justice. It's dramatic. And it's a recipe, historically, it's a recipe for collapse. Tied in with that, and, and the tying in bit is the bit that is really important here tonight, 
is the climate catastrophe, the degradation, the ecological crises that we're facing. The connection is that any system that has wealth inequity growing or of a certain level will always cause climate disruption, will always cause ecological degradation. Why? Because when you have people at a certain level of social stratification that's associated with financial inequity and people at other levels of stratification, you create the hotbed for businesses to exploit that environment and create perceived needs as compared to Max Neef's fundamental needs, for example. So in this circumstance, we have two phenomena happening. The first is the companies and the, the powers to be at the top largely create a narrative of competition, as we said before, and, and of me first. And then they prey on that in a way that creates status envy and aspirational consumption. And simultaneously, they create conditions by which certain people in that stratification don't have options when it comes to sustainability and choice. There's only one thing to purchase in my local supermarket, for example, only one kind of product is an example of that, that I see all too often in parts of the US and particularly in rural US. So this is really fundamental to what we're talking about here tonight, because if we understand that a system that has inequity built into it at various levels, and an expanding form of inequity, and we understand that that always creates the social stratification and the pressures on a society for overconsumption, then we start to understand that a capitalistic system built on a for-profit ethic, which is about the privatization of wealth, I'm in it in large part to bring wealth towards me with the notion that that's gonna work for everyone, there's gonna be a trickle down. If we see that, that connection, then we realize you could never have a form of capitalism in terms of one based on a for-profit ethic, which is fundamental to capitalism. You could never have a capitalism that enabled our sustainability. It's not possible. You might think we could innovate our way out of the challenges we face, but as Tim Jackson so beautifully writes, so clearly and so well-researchedly, he writes that the speed of innovation that we would need in order to innovate our way out of our challenges at the moment would be 16 times faster than what we've been used to. And I did my PhD looking at nanotechnology around the world, assessing what was happening, and some incredible things are happening. But let me tell you, there is no silver bullet when it comes to the challenges we're facing. Why? Because they're social and they go deep to our constructs of the stories we tell ourselves about what needs to happen and what matters in order to create a society of flourishing. So typically we do get those approaches put forward <clears throat> as the response to this crisis that both sit within a capitalistic response. The first is people say we can regulate our way out of this. But we know that when governments get heavy handed with regulation, they stifle both social and scientific innovation. They usually disempower individuals by pulling power close to them and the them in government is most commonly, sadly these days, at a federal level or a national level, in cahoots with business. So we see incrementalism and, and window dressing when it comes to reform, still within a for-profit mentality. The other side that's put forward is conscious capitalism. We can find ways to be more caring and purposeful while still doing for-profit business. So you, in the UK we have social enterprise, that's, that's certainly been pushed more and more. And within social enterprise, you have for-profit types of enterprises that have the capacity to privatise wealth. So the CIC, the Community Interest Company, limited by shares, is an example of a for-profit social enterprise where investors come in and can extract profit. And then you have not-for-profit social enterprise, like the Community Interest Company, limited by guarantee, where there's no individual owners, no equity owners, any ownership is nominal in the sense that the owners, if they have shares, can't trade those shares. They can't make a capital gains out of being involved. They can be employed, but there's no private ownership. So we have the difference between uh, social, social profit on the one hand and private profit on the other hand. And so 
the rise of, of conscious capitalism sits within this side of the sphere and says, we can do business better with corporate social responsibility, with putting a bit more heart into things, with caring about charities and caring about communities, terms like shared value, B Corps, all still sitting within this notion and story of a for-profit approach. But you see, the thing here is that nothing really changes when it comes to profit, because profit in a conscious capitalism system is still an end in itself, not just a means to an end. And in not-for-profit systems, profit, as social profit, is a means to an end only. And you can only have a world in a, and an economics of enough that's built on a system where profit is a means to an end, because otherwise you get this social stratification and the associated overconsumption. Now, the really exciting thing is that dramatic shifts have happened in the last 30 to 40 years in the way that not-for-profits engage with the world and the marketplace. 30 to 40 years ago, your typical not-for-profit organisation, your charity, was just that, something that relied on charity, external funding from government, from philanthropic sources, etc. Over the last 30 to 40 years, there's been a dramatic shift where not-for-profits have realised, largely through periods where crises have hit financially and their funding's dropped out for programs, they've realised there's a need for self-sufficiency to be built in to their own models. So they've shifted from a charitable model to an enterprise model. Hence, we have the rise of not-for-profit enterprise. The world's biggest not-for-profit organisation in terms of employment is an organisation in Bangladesh called BRAC. It employs 100,000 uh, employees, largely women, and they work in the fields of healthcare, education, some in finance. Guess where BRAC gets most of its money from? BRAC gets 80% of its $431 million each year from its own enterprises. It runs craft stores, bakeries, a printing press, a dairy. This is the way forward in terms of business. This is what is on the rise in the UK. And I know uh, there's been recent controversy, especially around the bank here, but you've got the co-op, which is a massive not-for-profit organization with so many different arms. You've got, uh, just yesterday I was in Bristol and opposite me um, at the, the table in a space called Create was someone working for Co Wheels Car Club, a car sharing service that's a not-for-profit business. So it employs people and it pays for its staff by money that it raises in the marketplace offering a service that happens to align with social outcomes. It's what here in this town in Totnes is called a transition enterprise something that actually looks to put community first and not privatise wealth, but have social and environmental outcomes in the process while providing livelihoods for people. Because so much of the great work that's been done around the world has to this point been done without financial reward. And many people struggle doing incredible work, struggle daily to provide for themselves. In fact, if we actually step back for a second and highlight one of the most important points about our global economy that gets missed, particularly when we talk about GDP and national measures of economic progress, let's just remember that probably the vast majority of the world's transactions are done in a gift economy, particularly by women, in that caring capacity, the looking after family members, the child raising, the child bearing. All of this happens in non-economic ways for the large part. And so it's important for us to consider that there are activities out there that can provide livelihoods for people when needed that complement the existing gift economy that already exists with a not-for-profit ethic. Now where this becomes really interesting is that when you look at capitalism and its trajectory and what's been happening with profit margins for companies, in the for-profit sphere, you see that with the rise of the digital era combined with resource shortages, we're actually heading towards an era where capitalism 
creates its own end. There comes a point at which companies can't compete with not-for-profit equivalents. That is pretty exciting. To have that level of determinism built into a system gives me a lot of hope. Because what's happening around the world now is people like yourselves are building the not-for-profit economy that's going to supersede the existing capitalist system. And the way that these compete is as follows, or outperform from the not-for-profit versus the for-profit sphere is as follows. Firstly, if you take two companies, and one's a for-profit and the other's a not-for-profit, and you say, what if they're doing exactly the same thing in a marketplace, what advantages do the not-for-profit have over the for-profit? Well, they've got financial advantages. Straight up, they probably get some tax exemptions. They probably uh, have the ability to receive donations that are tax exempt on some level. They also have an approach to procurement and sharing which is much more participatory than the for-profit sphere. And they don't have an addiction to employing people or services from other for-profit businesses necessarily at top dollar. So they look around, they hunt for better deals. They're more hungry for better deals in many ways, which is ironic, you wouldn't think that. But remember, we're talking here about not-for-profit enterprises, not typical big charities of the past. Although globally now, it's important to remember that in the latest study by Johns Hopkins University, 53% of not-for-profits income is now self-generated. And this is across 26 countries, including the UK and the US and Australia. We're talking about a major shift across most charities and most uh, organisations that are in the not-for-profit sphere, and this includes community land trusts that I know Erica here is working on, all the way through to large-scale not-for-profit enterprises or your Jamie Oliver's 15, etc. different kinds of businesses that are emerging. So there are financial advantages. There are also advantages when it comes to human resources. You can engage volunteers much more passionately and, in fact, in some places, engage volunteers at all compared to equivalent for-profits that don't have that access. You've got the rise of purpose-driven motivation, as Dan Pink talks about it. People wanting to get up and work for something good, rather than just going in and working for the machine. And that means a whole new pool of resources that the not-for-profit enterprises are able to tap into, and great, great talent, great passion, great skills, all combining in incredible ways. You've got higher levels of satisfaction at working at not-for-profits across most sectors. You've then got advantages when it comes to <clears throat> the actual productivity. If you look at research, uh, recent research, it shows that there's actually a correlation between a not-for-profit enterprise and higher levels of participation within the organisation, flatter structures, as compared to typical non-profits and for-profit entities. Not-for-profit enterprises, because of the fact that they're engaging with business models in an environment where the primary motivation for business is to fulfil social needs, because of those ingredients, they have flatter structures which enable more participation and innovation. And they're, therein, they are in more of a space to engage with things like open source technologies. They'll engage with <coughs> Mozilla Firefox, a not-for-profit enterprise itself, more often than your proprietised Internet Explorer, for example. They will look to use uh, WordPress, a free open source software, rather than a custom built platform that a proprietized uh, company that engages proprietized knowledge will use. They engage with things, therefore, that are cheaper, that iterate faster, that can move faster. One example of how this is incredibly, uh, this, this advantage is, in, is, is developing in incredible ways is Wikispeed, a company out of Seattle that manufactures cars. They're a not for profit organization. They got approached by a whole lot of venture capital looking to set them up, but the venture capitalists wanted to have a control over the ideas and, and could pull the pin on the project at any point. So they pushed back and they said, no, we're interested in doing this for the betterment of the environment and society. So they've built a 100 mile per gallon vehicle using open source design and $100 tools as compared to the 100,000 or million dollar tools that are in our massive assembly lines within the big car manufacturers. So using open source design, very inexpensive tools, 
and a bunch of volunteer interest and support from around the world, they've built a 100 mile per gallon vehicle that can be produced in anyone's village or town anywhere around the world with the right support for $19,000. And it's incredible stuff, particularly because they update the design every eight days. It takes the typical company like Toyota 30 years, I've been told, to update designs in terms of models. This is the future of innovation, and it's not for profit that's going to outcompete the for profits because they are open to engaging with the social good and engaging with design from around the world and iterating rather than the typical approach of big corporates, which is to be frightened of engaging with each other and connecting and helping each other in a non participatory way is, is their model, it's their approach to hold in the knowledge. So there's innovation advantages associated with not-for-profit enterprise. And then you have the rise of ethical consumption, you know, people giving a damn about where and what and from whom they purchase. And that lines up so much more beautifully with not-for-profits. Because not-for-profits care first and foremost on the whole, especially as not-for-profit enterprises, about social mission. They don't get waylaid by the fact that they have to make a ton of money for shareholders because they don't have any shareholders. So they don't have to cut the corners. If you work for Coca-Cola and you want to innovate in a certain way a product so that it's more environmentally sustainable or you want to do something that aligns with your customers or consumer base in a way that's meaningful, unless it makes that company money in terms of the bottom line, if it's going to cost more than it's going to make, forget it. But within a not-for-profit, you're encouraged to bring that idea to the table and then work out the details. Work out, OK, we'll need to build up this business or draw money across here to subsidise that. It's a different ethic that opens up a totally different way of doing business that fits finely with sustainability. The research shows that not-for-profit boards make much more ethical decisions than for-profit equivalents. And that's just understandable given the motivations that people have in engaging with not-for-profits. So there are hundreds of thousands of not-for-profit businesses around the world that are emerging, and massive ones too, like Saikatsu in South Korea, that has, uh, sorry, Hanselim in South Korea and Saikatsu in Japan, both of them equivalent sizes that work largely in the food area. So, uh, Saikatsu has 250,000 members, uh, Hanselim, I think 300,000, and both of these largely run by women doing distributed uh, food production and distribution, and they're not for profit, they're consumer cooperatives. They're running economies. And we're finding that not -for -profits, uh, the not-for-profit sector generally is increasingly taking more of that market share. In the US, for example, between 2001 and 2011, so a period that cuts through the financial crises, not-for-profits coming off a base of 1.2 million organisations increased their numbers by 25%. And the, during the equivalent time, for-profits increased their numbers by half a percent. Credit unions in the US that now have 100 million members as of a few weeks ago, 100 million members of not-for-profit financial institutions, institutions that reinvest money back into the, the community, no one at a credit union can make a capital gain out of being a member other than on their actual money that they have in, in terms of their loans. The profits that the bank makes go back into the organisation or back as a refund by way of lower loans or uh, lower loan costs or higher interest rates. How do the not-for-profit banks in the US outcompete the for-profit banks? Why have we seen some market share gain by credit unions? Well, it's simple. They offer lower, interest, uh, lo lower loan rates and higher interest rates. They have lower default rates on the whole. Why? Because they're locally grounded. They're connected generally to community. They're governed by volunteers who don't make decisions that affect the lining of their own pockets. Because they don't have to pay shareholders, they've got profit margin advantages that the for-profit banks don't have. So much so that in the 1970s in Canada, with the credit unions outcompeting the for-profit banks. The for-profit banks lobbied the government and the government overnight made credit unions by law be, uh, be for-profit. 
That's how strong the competition is and the advantages in the not-for-profit sphere. Now, fortunately, that's not something I think could ever happen today because of the rise of digital media and the like and the way that we've seen protests towards any move that suggests doing this in the US. The movement's strong enough now to head only in that direction, I believe. And this is where you come in because all of us here have interactions with businesses, perhaps run them ourselves, run not-for-profit organisations. And I'm encouraging you here to take this notion of a not-for-profit ethic that probably underlies a lot of your work and interests already and to expand it and to combine it with this notion of not-for-profit business. To encourage people who are coming through a system of education to consider setting up a not-for-profit business. It's not something that gets taught in most MBA programs, but it's something that despite the shift over the last 30 years to deregulation and privatisation has still managed to rise in incredible ways and holds the future for us in terms of an economics of enough. I want to leave you with one a story before we go into a moment for reflection and then some conversation with each other around us. Joseph Heller, he wrote the, the, that book Catch-22, he was out on an island at a friend of his uh, big party that was being thrown and his friend was a merchant banker who had made a lot of money. And another friend comes up to Joseph and says, hey Joseph, isn't it a bit depressing being here at, uh, at so-and-so's party? And Joseph said, why? He said, well, because that guy makes more money in a day than you will make probably in the entire lifetime of your book sales. And Joseph said, no, it doesn't bother me at all. And his friend said, why not? And he said, well, I've got something that he will never have, enough. <laughs>